Hey everyone, welcome to the Mobile User Acquisition Show. In the Mobile User Acquisition Show, we talk about how to use mobile user acquisition strategies to grow your app quickly and capital efficiently. The Mobile User Acquisition Show is presented by me, Shamant Rao, mobile growth leader and founder and CEO of the mobile growth consulting firm, Rocketship HQ. Each episode includes strategies, tips, and pointers from the leading edge of mobile user acquisition that you can use to unlock tremendous growth for your app in a sustainable and capital efficient manner. Our guest today is Paula Navis, product manager at Square Enix. In today's interview, we talk about how psychological models are integral for understanding user personas which in turn give us insights on how to attract, engage, and motivate very, very different kinds of users based on their personas and how one might influence what oftentimes is the essence of a game itself. This is very much a masterclass in gamer psychology and we are thrilled to present our conversation with one of the smartest folks in mobile today. I'm very excited to welcome Paula Neves to the Mobile User Acquisition Show. Paula, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Shiva. Absolutely, Paula. Uh, I'm thrilled to have you because certainly I've see, read about you being described as among the best mobile product managers around. Uh, and certainly you've written and you've used a lot of very intricate in-depth psychological frameworks uh, to understand gamer motivation, uh, many of which with, I've been very, very impressed by even when we last spoke, uh, just the sheer depth of everything you've done. So for all of those reasons, I'm thrilled to have you here today. Thank you right. so much uh, for, the, for the kind words. <laughs> absolutely. You know, we could start at the beginning. Uh, what first inspired you to start using psychological frameworks to understand play with player motivations and start impacting games? So yeah, um, good first question. I mean, uh, interestingly enough, I've been doing user acquisition for like 14 years, but my major to begin with was in psychology. So I'm a psychology major. After that, I did a postgraduate in marketing, went straight into UA, um, did user acquisition forever, uh, out of which the last seven years in gaming. Um, and most recently, I was always more focused in free-to-play gaming, which made my psychology degree really worth it in the end, because when I, when I first uh, did that, I, I wasn't sure how I would apply it to, to my current life in, in, in gaming and marketing. And, but with free-to-play, it just makes total sense uh, you know, to, to leverage the psychology to engage players more and, of course, monetize more. So that's where it started. Yeah. And when we talk about psychological frameworks uh, that are used in, to understand player motivations, what are some of the key models of frameworks that you recommend game product managers to use? And when should they be using these models? So oh, there, there are a lot of frameworks out there and there are a lot of um, models based on the same frameworks, but slightly differently, right? So the two main uh, theories in psychology uh, that, that are most applicable, um, in my opinion, is just the big five uh, personality uh, model, which is the, the ocean model. Um, and also the self-determination theory. So, so the big five, we have lots of tools out there that, that are exploring this now, um, using that as the basis uh, for their exploration. And it's very useful for pre-prod and for prod because it helps you determine what, you know, what will be that first thing that drives the user to your game. So that first impression, why he would download why he would download the game or why he would buy the game. Yeah. Um, the big five framework really helps understanding that. So it's a pre-prod uh, thing. And the self-determination theory is really interesting in, in explaining player engagement and motivation long-term. So it's really useful for, 
production and for live ops as well. Those are the two right. major ones. Right. So the self-determination theory. Uh, so what, very briefly, what's, what is the big five? What's the self-determination theory and how are they helpful? Yeah, so um, the big five, like I said, it's uh, called OCEAN as an acronym. So basically it says um, that people, they have these five factors and they score in a spectrum. So the first one is openness to experience and versus, you know, uh, so like they could be open or close to experiences. Yeah, yeah. They could be have conscientiousness or not. So extroversion or not. Um, agreeableness sure. or not, or be more neurotic or, or more stable. So these are five spectrums and it spells ocean because it's openness to sure. experience, conscientiousness, sure. extroversion, agreeableness. And then um, you, you score that uh, you, as a person, you would score something um, in all of those spectrums and that would give you one sort of personality. And depending on how you put that in your game, right? you will attract most likely uh, different uh, um, right. cohorts of, of that uh, personality. Um, and the ocean is just like when you do a lot of tests from like unfaithful uh, Facebook tests to more uh, uh, precise scientific ones, a, a lot of it is, is based on this as well. And the self-determination theory uh, basically talks about three factors, right? Uh, that all humans need in order to be uh, self-fulfilled and self-motivated. So all humans are born with the need to feel competent or masterful, to feel autonomous, like what they're doing has an impact um, and that they can do what they want in a sense, and to feel relatedness. Gotcha. So it sounds like before a game is launched, you're looking at what sort of people will it attract are they extroverted? Are they conscientious? Are they neurotic? Or, you know, you, that's what you're looking at. And what, mm -hmm. for a po game that is already live, you're looking at what motivates them, what will motivate them to keep playing, right? So you're uh, looking at that, right? So, uh, and also a lot of these models, my understanding is that they were all originally proposed and set up for AAA games. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for you, as you thought about applying this for free-to-play games, what had to change or what had to adapt uh, to make that happen? Thankfully, a lot of work has been done already in this field, so I didn't come with a blank slate uh, by, by people like Jason Vandenbergi. But you're right, it was done for uh, AAA games, right? So originally, when, when Jason Vandenbergi, for instance, he thought about his taste maps, which are basically a breakdown of the ocean theory in a way you can score your game across four different, the four different maps. Um, mm -hmm. Each of the five things I talked about, he broke up into four different maps. Um, but for instance, openness to experience that uh, in his mind would translate to novelty in a game. Sure. When it's time to score it on his map, he put an axis that's fantasy versus realism and another one that's builder plus ex uh, versus explorer and you would score your game sure. on that axis right um sure. but that axis is very triple a like fantasy realism you can't <laughs> talk about that in mobile free to play right like when you have yeah. all these match three abstract games yeah. right yeah so a big part of my my job here was to okay try and get his theory go back to hit the psychology books and say how can i get this essence but try and transform it into things that make sense for, for mobile free to play, which is what I've been working in for the past uh, five to six years specifically. So sure. um, for instance, fantasy and realism would become instead story context versus abstract uncontextualized um, right. because you can have an abstract um, um, right. mobile free to play game. There are many out there. Um, mm -hmm. The same thing I said, like builder versus explorer, becomes yeah. impact of the player to the world versus impact of the world on the player. Um, uh, okay. So this, we, we really had to play around with these axes and go back to the psychology books to, of course, to, to, to think of things that would make sense because I can't just like have an idea out of the blue. <laughs> so um, yeah. I, hit, 
I hit the books. I, I went into this again, tried different axes, and then we tested it against the users. And the first time it was a bit off, I, I would say. Um, yeah. So we perfected it throughout like three years. Um, and the final version that I have, I, I, I talk about in, in, a, in, a, in Mobile is Free, an, uh, an event uh, that, that I think it was two years ago that I, I spoke there about this. Um, we can share the link also. With the, we will. We will. Yeah. Um, and I talk more in depth about that. Um, totally. And, and how we did that change, right? But yeah. till today, I look at it as something like, I really wish people would, you know, call me or write me saying, you know what, I test something entirely different and it worked really well because I, I see it as a, like an ongoing thing still, you know. Certainly, certainly. And I think that could also be because each game can be different. Each game's users and uh, audience archetypes can be very different. So, right, so, yeah. And also, Paula, you said, look, uh, in the big five is something that you typically recommend looking at before launch. And I'm curious, for a game that has not yet been, been launched, how do you infer uh, what with the audiences, ideal audiences, extroverted or introverted, or thrill seeking, or you know, or if the story access makes more sense, or the impact of the player of the on the world is more substantial. How do you evaluate that even before a game is launched? Yeah, so it depends on the model you want to use. The theory will usually always be the big five behind that question, but sure. which model, right? Um, if you use the taste maps, which is what I just mentioned. You, you have basically the four charts and you score your game against all the factors, right? And it's a really interesting communication tool because we wouldn't do it together. If we were uh, in the same game team, I would do it separately, you would do it separately. And then yeah. we would, uh, the main stakeholders would do that exercise and then we would talk about it. Typically, we would see very different, very, very different results per person, yeah. right? And then I realized, okay, so someone's, you know, ver uh, vision for this is completely different than mine. So the first thing is that we align our visions as stakeholders. Uh -huh, and that uh -huh. saves so much time, so much rework, right. so much uh, uh, time. Um, if you're using another model, not the taste maps, but another model based, uh, based on this, now um, I feel that a lot of tools are starting to play, pay attention to, to psychology and starting to push this because UA is becoming harder. With iOS 14, no one knows what's gonna happen. So psychology and looking into player motivation is, I feel it's the, the next frontier in a way. Um, sure. So it's, it's nice that we have new models coming up, right? Always based on, on the big five. So currently what we did for the game I'm working on, which is pre-launch, is we used uh, a specific tool um, that has a chart. It's similar to the approach of the taste maps, but it's a chart that breaks down 12 different user motivations. And we, we did the same thing. We scored separately our game, the vision we had for our game across that, um, and then we aligned. And we were like, okay, this is the game we wanna make. It's not this one, we're all aligned. Um, okay, next step what are the audiences this game will cater to, right? right. Um, and then, uh, of course, that during this whole process, there's a lot of benchmarking. We're looking at over 20 different games out there, looking at their audiences using these tools um, and being able to tell, okay, so the chart we have now looks very similar to um, the chart for an explorer type of player or uh, a more like aggressive type of player. And then once we have that chart, it's very easy to see which audience uh, will obviously be more prone to that game. And then you have to validate it because everything I do, uh, we put data, but I guess yeah. I'm gonna talk about it <laughs> a little bit yeah. later. Otherwise yeah. this will be a, a long answer, so. Certainly, certainly. And I certainly uh, have in my notes to ask you about data and how it fits into something just qualitative. Uh, but to uh, ask you a bit more about your last answer. So you're basically in a pre-launch game, you're saying, look, these are the different parameters on which 
so if uh, on which I evaluate this game, you have your teammates do the exact same thing, then you sit in a room and say, oh, I thought this was thrilling and you think this is comfortable, where is the disconnect? And so it sounds like you're aligning on, do we have even have the same vision for the game, right? Yes. Yeah. That's the first yeah. question, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And what's typically the outcome of this exercise? Do you walk away with a feature roadmap? Or what, what does it look like? So again, it depends on where you are with your game. But um, typically teams will have a bunch of ideas. Ideas is never are never an issue like not having ideas. Teams are super yeah. creative usually. Um, and then you have this, these, all these ideas. Once you've defined, like you said in your example, oh, I thought it was thrilling because we had these ideas and you thought it was not a thrilling game because it was more of an exploration game or something like that. Yeah. Um, once we align and we say, yeah, it's an exploration game, but we really want to push this and this idea. So maybe it's a three in, you know, not a five, but a three in, in, in uh, thrilling. Um, you're instantly looking at your idea list, right? Sure. If you already have a feature list, it helps you prioritize that, right? right? Because you can, look at the, you can look at your feature list if the game is already moving more into in, in production. You can look at your feature list and say, okay, using your same thrill example in our vision it's a five but we have with currently what's designed on paper that we're going to build it's a three so it's a big delta from two to from three to five so we need to think about more things more features in that sense so it helps you not only prioritize features but re like revalidate your your current uh, ideas and feature list gotcha and in that case sounds like there's quite a bit of subjectivity. What happens if there's a disagreement? Uh, if you're like, I think this is thrilling, you think it's not. I think there's a five, I think it's easy. they think that's a one. What happens? <laughs> well, even though like I'm in Montreal, it's not like a fight in a hockey game or anything like that. <laughs> I'm very lucky, like I, I work with the best possible people. Everyone's very reasonable. So no, we, there are no like really big fights. We just discuss and try and see our vision, right? Um, yeah. In the end, there's always a major stakeholder that also has the business vision that will, will have the like final word per se, but sure. we've never really needed to get that far because we discuss sure. it as a team and we're able to, to get to, a, to a, a, an understanding. Um, gotcha, gotcha. And something else you spoke about, Paola, was how you're an analyzing other games. You said you analyze over 20 games. So when you're doing that, what does that analysis process look like? Like, are you like sitting in a room for multiple days? Is there a specific format in which you take notes? What, what, what does that uh, structure look like of an analyzing the competitive landscape? Yeah, so... Um... Like I said, all of this exercise, even though it seems subjective in a first uh, glance, yeah. it all comes from business needs and the market. Um, that's, how, that's how we ship our games, right? Uh, we, yeah. Of course, we have a lot of creative ideas and, and we're a very creative studio and that's the first thing, right? The most important yeah. thing, but we need to validate uh, the business potential and the business needs uh, for that uh, game. And, and that's my job, basically one of my jobs. Um, yeah. so, so yeah, so basically, I mean, by pre-prod, you should have a big list of, you know, benchmarks you want to look into, uh, even for like small aspects of your game. So, um, I've done this exercise in different ways. I've done it where people would think on their own time and then we would adjourn in like a four hour meeting to to align everything because it's the this alignment period is never fast right because you're you're uh, um ironing out uh the communication so and and i've done it in a way also that we took a week to do like a workshop focused on figuring out the vision and, and the mission and everything for for the game so it works depending on your team and how busy you are, uh, 
sometimes like if, if you're super, super busy, like currently uh, we're all super busy, you need to say, okay, let's take a week. It's like you're on vacations. We're on a workshop. Um, <laughs> let's go off site if possible. Nowadays it's a bit complicated, but um, yeah. You know, it would even help to go off-site for three days to, to do this sort of thing, you know. But it, it saves a lot of time and, and, and rework, right, if, if visions are aligned, um, if communication yeah. is clear. Yeah, yeah, and it certainly appears to be one of those high-level things with far-reaching implications for many, many years because you're essentially defining what the essence of the game itself is. What, uh, what the app itself is. Uh, so I can certainly see why it can take time and why it needs to take time. Uh, however, uh, you know, have you faced resistance or question marks uh, when you say, oh, we need to take five days, play 20 games, come back. Uh, is somebody like, no, that's just too much time. Have you faced this resistance? Or, uh, yeah, uh, you know, if somebody does face this resistance, how would you recommend they think about it? Yeah, so there's there's always resistance, right? Um, yeah. In my mind, the best way to mitigate resistance is when you pitch something like this, you know, we need to do this, you come prepared with articles, with things that will show people that, you know, it's not just me saying this will help us uh, because these other companies did this because um, I've done this in the past and look at the result that we had. Um, so usually resistance i try to sort of fight with evidence and data right um, so i would suggest you know come with a basis some people will be super thrilled always like the product people the designers they're always super thrilled about this um, but there's always some resistance and so come prepared um, because it's sort of a pitch sometimes right yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like you're making a pitch right so come prepared yeah. come with articles um, there's a lot of black Gladly today, there's a lot of stuff out there on this. So just come prepare that show data if possible. Certainly. Um, that usually convinces people. <laughs> Wonderful, yeah, yeah. And hopefully people will produce this interview and link to it. How do you focus groups or user testing exercises, how do they fit into using these psychological frameworks, if at all they do? Yeah, so, um, like I said a little bit earlier, I always try to bring back data into the picture, right? So after we do this, this like a uh, mythical exercise, sometimes it seems, <laughs> but it's yeah. actually, it's actually pretty sciencey for, for, because you actually are putting numbers to things. It's, but it's, it is subjective. Um, after you do that, one, one thing I always like to do, it's just also because of my background in UA is using UA to try and validate stuff, right? We're not going to take just anything and say, okay, you know, this is it. We will use UA and, and, and the different to test out, for instance, the different archetypes and user testing comes in very heavily in that sense as well for us. That's the moment where we tell the team and we have an awesome team that we work really closely. Um, we tell the team, listen, these are the archetypes we came up with or the personas or whatever word you want to use. Um, let's do two things. Let's run user tests and ask them specific questions and see how they're playing. But also something that really, really helps us is putting in-game surveys. Uh, and these in-game surveys, they work in a way where they are, they ask users about specific features. So this is once you're already tech launched or soft launching, um, you ask user, users how they're playing, how they're scoring some of these features. Depending on what they answer, you can bucket them into the different archetypes or personas. Sure. Uh, we have their user IDs uh, as well. So after we do that, we go into our analytics platform we check their IDs and we see how they're playing the game and see if it makes sense with our vision of that archetype playing the game and what they're saying that they're doing, right? Um, yeah. So user research helps us throughout the whole process. In pre-prod, user testing helps a lot because we don't have the service. And then once we're in production and we have um, a tech launch or soft launch, 
we keep doing the, the tests every time we launch a big feature to see if it appeals to, to the people we want it to appeal, plus the in-game service. Uh, so that's how we do it. Gotcha. And when you said you use UA to test archetypes, what's an example of how you might do that? Uh, so let's say you've, you've done the exercise and you see that your game will probably have two main or three main uh, types of players. Uh, the way we, we like to approach this is to do appeal tests, right? What would a creative look like for Persona A, for Persona B, and for Persona C? So if Persona A is more um, a, a thrill sort of, uh, uh, um, you know, driven person, we will look for the most thrilling features that we have or that we currently planned and put that like forefront in the video or in the static. Videos are better for, for, for that. So we will do that for the different ones. And we will, we will gauge um, CTR. We will gauge if, if the game is already in soft launch, you can gauge uh, even an IPM all the way down to the IPM. Um, so you can gauge the entire funnel right? Um, sure. And, and see if, if it makes sense, but also look at the reach, right? Because it basically is the, the size of your pie in the market, because if, if it's too niche, then, you know, um, so it helps. And, and, and by the time you're in the end of soft launch, at least the way I like to do it, I do like to have a pulse on the monetization, even though you're in soft launch, even going, uh, uh, down to using purchasers in like uh, app event campaigns, uh, using our first purchasers group to actually gauge LTV, gauge ROAS. And you have those creatives per persona. So you can actually start gauging monetization potential per persona. Um, right. And then that drives your monetization strategy as well. Um, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and, and then you might realize, oh, persona C, it's basically a persona that will help us with virality. It'll bring in new players, but it's not a high monetization one, but that's okay because, you know, right. so it's a whole process and it helps throughout. Yeah. yeah. And I imagine once you type to UA, there's more data, there's more quantitative uh, stuff, you know, insights available to back up the more qualitative insights you had earlier on in this process. Right. Exactly. Um, and, and, depending on what how you create your campaign as well um you know you have different ad sets for different uh, personas you will know using your your attribution partner where these users came from and you can see in the game okay so these came from the thrill uh, the thrilling persona um how are they playing the game you know um right where are they churning so you can really go deep into the analyses once you have a a yeah. beta game or, or a soft launch game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're linking user behavior in game to what brought them in. That's what messaging brought them in and see how they behave. Very yeah. interesting, very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and thus far, we've been mainly talking about how you might apply this to a game that's either in the process of launch or, uh, you know, is getting ready to launch. Uh, how might the application of these models change if you have a game that is already live, already running, already has lots of players uh, actively engaged? Yeah, uh, so it's a, it's a really good question and it's also very much applicable. I do believe that the earlier you use it, the better. So if you can use it from pre-prod from the start, that saves a lot of money and time. But uh, if, you know, you're, even if you used it in the beginning, you might need to use it later on. So it depends on the business needs. So just to give an example, to make it clearer, um, in a previous company, we had a game that was one of our major cash cows. It was doing very well, but there was a business need there uh, for a longer term retention. Mm -hmm. And we started analyzing how the players were playing and we detected that maybe, um, if we put some specific social things in the game where I could invite a friend and play directly against him and not just a random multiplayer that we had, we had a hypothesis that that would bring in that extra peer pressure and engagement that we needed for the long run. So that was our hypothesis. And we used the tool 
and the models to, to validate their, that or not. So we started scoring our game. And lo and behold, our game was pretty low in the specific like social competition yeah. aspect. So the, the framework to help, helped us before, because it was a feature that was costly to develop, right? So before we went all in, the model helped us validate, do users really want this? Is there really a need for this? Of course, at this point, you're also reading the user reviews and all of that. You're not just looking at that, right? Um, but it was very clear to us after we scored the game that there was a gap there, so an opportunity there for these social features. We went ahead, we did it, and we did it in the way that not only brought engagement, but also you could literally invite people that didn't have the game installed. So uh -huh. it brought up virality together with it. And it, it was like <laughs> from, from day wow. one, a 30% increase in just organic wow. users coming from, from that alone, right? It was already a pretty established game with a large DAU, um, yeah. but it was, it was like, you know, it, instant the way it, uh, it helped us. So it was a validation tool in that case, you know. Absolutely. And that sounds like a very dramatic win that you were able to unlock with uh, by just applying some of these models. And just to dig into some of the specifics of that, you said you looked at the game itself, scored the features and said, oh, we don't have the social competition in the game itself. How do you find out if the users actually want it and maybe open and receptive to social competition features? Yeah, so we, not only we score it, but we know our audience types and our personas and what motivates them, right? So we will see that. that. How, do you, how do you find that out? Oh, how do we find the, the personas? Yeah, for, for so a live game, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's the same process of scoring. Um, okay. The process doesn't exactly. change. And once exactly. you have a, a chart, you're able okay. to fit the personas to that chart, see which okay. personas fit better. Um, once you have that, um, you can say, okay, so we have a persona here that's big on social. Uh, they're very big on co-op, but they're even bigger on competition. Our game has none of those. So, right. you know, there's, right, a, there's right, an opportunity right. there. Then you look at the same time, you look at the benchmarks. The benchmarks right. that have similar motivational drivers to you, what are they doing? And they have this, okay. You look at user, um, user research as well, of course, the user tests. You look at the, if your game is live, you have a bunch of, of user sure. reviews. You collect all of that before um, you go and build this costly thing that no one wants, right? right. So, <laughs> so this, right. Is, this is sort of how we, we, we validate it. And sometimes okay. if, if you use it from the beginning, you already know the gaps you have. Right, but you're yeah. you're still building. You have it in soft launch there, but you yeah. know, you know what? For the MVP, we're going for this. We need social in there. We know we need it. We will prioritize it. But this is our core loop. It's done. It's good for our day one to day seven in our soft launch. So we're going for this. But first thing we're building is this because it's missing. Um, right, right. For this specific game, we did it differently because we didn't have the option to use it in the beginning but it's, sure. still, it's still really validated it to us. And it was a game, uh, very hyper-casual, so it was very UA-driven. Um, and the fact that we put in this, um, this feature, it just put a lot of pressure off of UA with organic yeah. rising. Um, and yeah. of course, you know, that means lower CPI, we went up in the charts, everything looked beautiful. So. Certainly, that can be a massive virtuous cycle. Uh, that can be unlocked just by, you know, uh, using many of these tools to uh, engage players better. So for a developer that's never used any of these models, they're like, Paula, this is amazing. This is exciting. I want to use it for my game. What, where should they begin? What's a good starting point? Okay. Um, good question. You don't need to go to psychology at uh, a okay. university. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Thankfully, there's a lot of things out there today. So Basically, it would really help looking into the theories, like the frameworks first. Um, yeah. I know it might sound a bit alien for people that haven't studied this, but uh, there are a lot of resources uh, on, on self-determination theory on the big five. Then look at the work by uh, Jason Vanderberg, the work by Immersive as well, Scott Rigby and Immersive. They, they have some really good stuff on there. Um, 
and there's also like a lot of um, a lot of new tools coming up with with uh, this motivational uh, uh, aspect of players and wanting to leverage that. And they also have great resources. Um, I've written a lot of stuff around this, so of course, I mean, in the links there there will be links to to the mobile heroes. I have a sure. bunch of articles there on this. Even looking sure. at other things like the Maslow, the pyramid, uh, Maslow pyramid versus the Tower of Want in game design and things like that. But always start with the theory because that's the basis of everything. Yeah, totally, totally, totally. And we will link to all of that in the show notes in your writings as well. Uh, Paula, this has been very instructive to me personally. Uh, certainly, there's very many notes I'm going to take. Uh, uh, thank you so much for being on the Mobile User Acquisition Show. This is perhaps a good place for us to wrap. Uh, but before we do that, can you tell folks how they can find out more about you and everything you do? Sure. So, um, like we said, there will be the links there uh, for, for people to check out. Also, um, there's always my LinkedIn. You can add me there. Um, sure. It's Paula D. Neves. Um, just D is the middle name for my, the initial for my middle name, and that's also my uh, Twitter handle. Um, Wonderful. So you can, you can uh, find me around in, in the social media. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, we will link to all of that, and we will link to many of the resources that you did speak about. Paula, for now, this has been a pleasure. Thank you again for being on the show. For me, too, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. For more tips, pointers, and strategies from the leading edge of mobile user acquisition, subscribe to our YouTube channel right here or check out our blog, rocketshiphq.com slash blog. Thank you.